So I know we will have some folks rolling in. Uh, I know Sonia is joining us. Just doing some last minute getting people together. And the Zoom link sharing to the group. Yep. We have our very fancy special weekend. If anyone is seeing this, then congratulations, you made it. I'm not sure my set. You need me to. Yeah, she's got it. By all spines. Just send it out. There it is. Got it? Yeah. All right. Okay, so Doug is going to join by Zoom. Sonia at 6.15 is going to join by Zoom. Carlos and Danielle, we've heard from that they can't come. Unfortunately, they will not be able to make it. But that should be everybody then, other than um, our newest member, right? Um, Gabriel. Yeah, Gabriel. And yeah. Leah. Oh, yes, Leah. <laughs> Science scene. Um, so we don't know. We're creatures of habit. Yeah. Well, we will start with us. Okay. And then as either people filter in or up on Zoom, we'll have them introduce themselves. Um, so we'll just start with introducing ourselves. Uh, my name is Michael. My pronouns are they, them. And I am um, the person who represents kind of the disability community and some pieces of the queer community. And um, we're doing a uh, little digest meeting here. Money, I'll go. I'm Malcolm Himshoot, he, him, um, in Orono, part of this committee um, to work across the years on the kinds of um, uh, both like memory that will be transformative uh, in different parts of the community and transformation that goes along with that. I'm Emily Ross. I am um, a member of the committee. Um, born a resident for like six years or so. I've graduated the university um, and I work at Rose Bike and member of the career committee. Happy to be here. Yeah, nice. I know that. Um, oh, we got Sonia. Hello. Hey, awesome. Folks. She's in. Good to see you. Can you hear us all right? Awesome. You want to give a quick introduction for any folks at home? Of who I am? Hello, I'm Sonia Berthasel. I'm a member of the Orono Town Council and the Town Council Liaison to this DEIB committee. Awesome. Thank you. All right. So today's uh, special Little Digest meeting uh, is to kind of go through some of the material that um, our lovely um, kind of town, what is, what is Sophie's title? Town manager. Town manager, yes, thank you. Town manager Sophie put together for us as well as... Um, so uh, I wanted to flag and just sort of give credit where credit's due. It was actually Councillor Sarah Marks who did the, the research that we um, delved into for this. Well, okay, fantastic. Okay, so Sarah Marks is our um, very grateful researcher and uh, compilation individual. 
Um, so basically what we're going over today is Orono's connection to the Wabanaki history and Chief Orono and going over kind of the series of events that have been going on for, um, I would say about three years is the timeline that we're looking at, possibly longer um, with um, some other documented events. One of the, um, we kind of wanted to give a quick background of what that looks like. Um, one of the things that uh, we were really grateful to get to look at was a council workshop that took place in August of 2020. And that saw uh, Darren Ranko, uh, who I believe, is, uh, who is a, who's the chair of Native American programs at the University of Maine. I'm not sure if he is still in that position, um, but at the time he was, um, and he's associated with the Penobscot Nation and is a longtime Orna resident. Uh, he was actually able to give us a really nice uh, lineage and timeline of life for Chief Orno, kind of looking at the history of um, Chief Orno living from the mid to mid to late 18th century into the 19th century. Um, and Chief Orno is uh, a Penobscot chief who was a pretty large figurehead for a lot of different um, uh, like revolutionary pieces of the Penobscot uh, presence in Orono. Um, looking at a lot of uh, like oral histories and written histories, we were able to see a lot about um, Chief Orono through uh, several other like written compilations. Um, Fanny Hardy X Storm, I believe is how you pronounce that last name. Pardon with me if I'm not 100% correct on that. Um, chronicling the Penobscot people and places. There was a big conversation on um, his lineage being traced to a 17th century Penobscot leader. Um, I heard this name at least 40 times during the presentation and I still am not sure that I'm gonna pronounce it correctly. Um, it's Madoka Obando. Oh. Yes, I had to sound that one out. So if you could say, if you want to try and say that one a little louder, I believe you're correct. Chief Madaka Wando. Yes, Madaka Wando. Thank you. Yes. Um, and he was a big part of tracing Chief Orono's history into um, some of the later, uh, some of the earlier in history Penobscot leaders. Uh, there was a really great uh, conversation around uh, Madaka Wando talking about uh, their about his relationship with the French and the English and talking about a lot of uh, the initial contact between the French and the English and what that looked like for the Penobscot. And Madaka Wando was a really um, pivotal part of moving um, the Penobscot Nation kind of into the light in a different way from kind of when the time of a very heavy British rule came uh, into the uh, more kind of American time that we look at obviously during the Revolutionary War. Um, and um, Manaka Wando's daughter, um, she married no. a Michael, could I make a, a suggestion? I'm, I wonder if we could just refer anyone who's curious for the like really awesome details on this history to that other meeting and maybe move a little bit quicker into our conversation just in the interest of, of time totally. and there being a lot to discuss. I'm curious how others feel about that. Yeah. Um, okay. So, so of the four people here, did we each get to view the video, Sonia, um, Emily, and yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. I've, so we've I watched the first three and um, wasn't able to get through a couple of the the later pieces, um, but I was on council for a couple of the later pieces, so I should have experienced them. Yeah, I believe that I got I, I got through everything that was available. And I'm here um, by voice, but I don't know how to get my video on. Can you hear me? Is that Doug? I can hear you. That is Doug. Yes, we we can hear you, Doug. Okay, I can see you, but I, I don't know how to show my face. 
How about you, Doug? Were you able to view those earlier videos um, where Orno had education presentations? I, I did, and I was fascinated by uh, James Francis's presentation. Uh, yes. Yes, he was a fantastic storyteller. Honestly, I was so impressed with a lot of what he had to say. It definitely gave me a lot of um, a lot of pause in a way. I guess I would explain it like that. A lot to think about. And Emily, did you get a chance to um, sort of do the homework on this and look through all the videos too? Okay, awesome. So, oh, Doug, nice to see your face. Hey, hey. I guess I guess we're. Um, I'm stuck here, stuck here taking care of Pip. So. Uh... Oh, hi, Pip. <laughs> um, yeah, I think we may be ready to get into it then. Yeah. So, so, and Sonia was going to lead tonight's meeting is what I remember. Are you I able think, to do that? I, I, I think that we said we were going to kind of collectively share the responsibility of just having an honest conversation about the homework we've done. And so, um, I think I'd open it up to, um, reflections and noticings and things that feel important to, um, kind of name and, and learn from at, as we, uh, as this group hopefully can provide some guidance to the town council about how to, um, you know, re rectify any missteps in the past and look toward how we want to be working with um, the Penobscot folks um, around acknowledging Penobscot presence in town going forward. Yeah, I think um, one of the big things I wanted to highlight, um, starting with kind of Sarah Marx's notes, uh, was definitely kind of uh, some of the things that she was able to draw from uh, the research that she did that was such like such an important part of really um, re-looking at what the town's decisions are and the impacts that those had. Um, she really pulled that relationships are key, and that was something I definitely found as well. They're definitely, um, I highlighted in my own notes a lot about the way we're going about relationships, because I think that um, I talk a lot, I definitely talk a good amount about kind of the idea of um, strengthening those relationships through education and meaningful contact. Um, she also talks about kind of the town as an entity apologizing slash admit, admitting the process didn't go well and how that would be seen as more of a growth mindset and not really critiquing um, the past councils so that we kind of aren't going back with a, a sense of blame or looking more towards like, okay, well, what can we bring to the future rather than kind of in, intensifying the incorrect pieces of the past. Um, definitely being, uh, she says, being clear as a town council, and I think that definitely as kind of a sub piece of the town council, I do think that it's an important part that we also sort of kind of take up arms in that in a way to really try and uh, be clear as to what we're willing to do going forward, what we are doing going forward, and not laying out options that we're not actually going to do or that we like realistically would have issues with. Um, one last thing that I that she highlights that I think is so important um, is the idea of a formal apology to the tribal council and asking to present that apology into the council uh, in person. And that was definitely something that I found really important definitely because I feel like um, there's been a lot of informality that has led to a lot of blunders that I think that would be uh, giving something formal really shows uh, definitely that growth mindset that she's talking about. Yeah. Those four, like four points in Sarah's document of, of recommendations. Um, on the way to get there, I would say that one thing I took away was that when in September, council had some debrief or uh, unpacking time based on the August 2020 presentation, somebody said something that's really, really stuck with me because it was both true and, and, and hard, which was that um, uh, 
a council member said, what was here is made invisible by what is here, but it's still here. Yeah, she said, and that is like everything. And this this notion of invisibility, um, which does harm that it's not it's like systemically it's not accidental. It's it was the project of erasure. It was the project of genocide. And then in different centuries, that looks different in different decades. So but the invisibility was the impact in this case of the the town signage that used to have a picture of somebody who um, is part of the heritage of people still in this place. And then that image was tracked, was taken away. So that word invisibility, I could say more about that. I don't know if I should go off a little more or not. Um, okay, I will, I will, why not? The a person in my church community gave me this video, Invisible, to watch just recently. This is a 2006 DVD that she got from the town of Warno Library. Um, so the it's one called Invisible, James and James maybe? Francis was one of the I was gonna, James, that, that's, documentaries. That was talked about in one of the meetings. It was talked about, uh, I believe it was council member uh, Grinier who uh, was talking about taking it out from the library and having a viewing party and then being uh, wildly interested in uh, James Francis's work and uh, realizing that uh, he wanted to yeah, pull that up for everybody you can see. I don't know if you can see. I like know the very title of it back in 2006 yeah. was working to overcome the forced invisibility. Um, uh, yeah, so we've, we, by the missteps made, we have stumbled into that exact same pain and done the exact same wrong. So, uh, so that's important to, to address. And these, these notes are, are very detailed ways of saying um, that something important needs addressed. The ones, the notes that I think we could help follow up on and this Sarah Marks document would be starting on page three, like number two, number three, number six. And then at the very end, that idea of the apology that Michael, you highlighted. Um, so maybe there's a way that we can, um, you, well, what we're doing tonight is using tonight's meeting to amplify the messaging that we, we believe it was meant to be heard. But maybe there's some steps we can carry forward after this. And those are the ones <laughs> I would draw our attention to. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I think um, one of the things, I, I took some quotes from um, our, first, um, our first look at the council's um, kind of discussion. That's the August 17th. Uh, 2020 meeting and one of the some of the things that really stood out to me is um, Darren Renko actually said if we do this collaboration right there's a lot to be gained and I think that that is such an intensely important piece is I think that like in doing a collaboration with the Penobscot Nation correctly there really is so much to gain and I feel like we as a council, as a town, and kind of as like a general um, historical uh, body, I suppose, um, we really can benefit from collaborating with them in so many different ways. And I think that um, a lot of what I thought, a lot of what I took away from uh, that meeting was definitely, um, James, uh, Eric Francis's conversation on place and language and landscape. And I love the, um, the concept that he had, the space plus culture equals place. And kind of talking about how the context of culture can make a place widely different. And like in the context of non-native people, the Penobscot River Valley is a logging area and the paper mills and the pollution and now the river restoration. However, substituted with the point of view of the Penobscot people, you quote, you get a different sense of place. And I felt like there was a lot of really interesting opportunities to 
uh, incorporate that idea of space and that idea of place and what it means to people. And I think that that was something that was brought up in also the later two meetings that we looked at was that idea of how can we integrate the Penobscot's idea of space uh, or of place into um, the identity of Orno. That was something that somebody said was how to use the sense of place to identify Orno. And I felt like that was super important because there was a lot of really great suggestions that I felt like were in that meeting that I'd love to highlight. Obviously, um, James suggested kiosks or mapping uh, to honor the sense of place. And uh, they talked actually a lot about land acknowledgements, which was something that comes up in one of the later uh, conversations because there was an actual land acknowledgement for the Penobscot Nation that was drafted. Um, I was helped to see that the June 2021 council action and this statement, I guess I didn't really know it existed, but it is, I mean, it, it exists and yeah, it yeah. is a acknowledgement <laughs> of yeah, actually acknowledging the historic yeah. and contemporary. Yeah, I um, really appreciated um, Jeff Wingard's work drafting that and um, have actually referenced it during my time on town council to try to get the town council to be supportive of um, Wabanaki issues more broadly, but I think it's, I thought it was an important step forward. Um, I am curious, uh, Emily and Doug, what some of your takeaways are. I think it would be great if we can, um, especially as a share, small group, make sure that we share airtime and give a lot of space to, to everyone to reflect. Uh, there's just one one thing I want to say. Um, just want to point out in your document, Michael. Uh, yeah. Yeah, Michael. I think it's. I know this is just personal notes, but uh, instead of associated with the Penobscot Foundation, he's a he's a member of the Penobscot Foundation. He is okay. Uh, yeah, that was something that uh, I had made kind of a, a note on because I wasn't sure. Yeah. Because uh, James sort of made himself more um, noted, I would say, as an indigenous figure. So I wasn't hundred percent sure. Thank you so much for that clarification. Um, one thing that I kept repeating in my head um, uh, that Darren Rico said was um, the solutions, um, especially about, I think he was uh, focusing specifically on um, having more of a Penobscot presence in like the signage in town. Um, he used the word creative, um, which I was like, creative, yeah. This can be this can be fun. This can be um, this can be a really meaning. Not it doesn't have to be serious. I mean, of course there is a. I, I should not have said that. That was um, uh, this is a really serious thing. But um, there is a side that um, we can bring art and and life into this project. Um, and it was just that word creative. Just a little, a little spark in my head. It was a great focus on like that they kept coming back to about working with local native artists, working with people to put art around the town, to look back at obviously the signage, like for the seal. And like uh, one of the things they highlighted was obviously bringing in a native artist to make the seal look less clip artish, which I definitely think was something that I noticed a lot in when they presented it. I think I'm still, I, I reread the, the notes a bunch. I'm still just kind of unclear how got to this particular sign, but I, I'll just um, go over. But in that, in that first video, the focus on having indigenous artists involved, um, having formal engagement, just, yeah, I guess years passed for um, the signage. Came to be, but uh, there's a there's a disconnect in, in my head about that. I appreciate the uh, invitation, Sonia, to speak. I uh, <clears throat> sorry, I'm distracted uh, dealing with uh, some potty training issues <laughs> with with Pip here. So um, the <clears throat> I guess. Um, one thing that uh, I think Darren Ranko said um, is to start small. 
and be specific. And and, um, and I guess I would, you know, want to honor that. And um, like one of the things that seemed like a, an open gesture, and I can't remember the exact thing. It was um, talking about Maine and um, and and sort of our view of the world is Maine exists, but that doesn't fit really with the Penobscot nation and the territory that they they lived on. <clears throat> so I just culturally want to be really humble. And, and I'm not sure how, I'm not really sure how a, an apology would be received. I mean, there's so many things that, that, that the white world, the European world, English world, French brought onto this population that there's, uh, I don't know. I guess, given that larger context, I would really want to, and I think there was an invitation from Darren to talk with us about what might be uh, good small steps forward. So my two cents was. Yeah. We also think have this matter expert who wrote these notes in the room tonight. I'm wondering if you brought comments, Sarah, or if you came as a listener tonight, or what, what would you add? Um, I really came to listen to you all. Um, I have been talking to uh, our council chair, Jeff Wingard, um, and he and I will be meeting soon, I hope. He's supposed to be sending me a time. Um, I would say on the apology suggestion that that came directly from the people who were consulted and when they were asked what we do next, they said before going forward on these other steps at this point, I think a formal apology is needed because the process didn't go well, at least at the end. Um, so I think just, I don't know if Doug can hear me, but that came from Penobscot folks directly suggesting that that would be a good next step for council to take um, as part of not a big mea culpa, but like it didn't go perfectly. Things went wrong in spots and it didn't end up where anybody wanted it to end up. Yeah. Um, in terms of how people feel about the process, the, the council really, really was trying hard not to offend and yet somehow things got, they got missed. And that just happens sometimes, I think, with cross-cultural work, it can be hard. Um, so just to answer Is Doug's that question. Is heard by folks on Zoom? Yes. So that, that came from Penobscot folks as their suggestion of what would be a first step before trying to do some of these other cool and creative ideas, which they also agree are cool and creative and would be nice to move forward on. So the apology yeah, was from the town council, is that right? And, yeah. And, what, and what's the and apology the for? Uh, just, is that clear? Sorry, could you, you, could you say that again, Doug? I uh, lost you for a minute there. I just would want to be clear about what it is, what, what's the apology for and about. And, uh, yeah. I think, could it be, yeah, what happened was one part of the mechanisms of the town put something in motion with the signs and another part of the town thought about this thoughtful dialogue, but the dialogue yeah. never impacted on the signage process, because that's what it looks like to me. Yeah, and I mean, I think to me what, what matters in these situations is, is impact, and I heard as a member of the town council getting emails from folks after the signage was changed that, um, that it really felt like erasure and did not feel good to um, Native people who wrote to me. And so I think that's what I would apologize for is that, um, you know, the, we, the town council had this sort of complicated process over about nine years and there were different iterations of counselors involved. So it's, it's um, not any sole person's fault, but at the same time, the, the impact at the end of the day was that um, a lot of our neighbors felt that there was um, an erasure happening that is really a perpetuation of, um, you know, a history of genocide. And so, if I personally feel 
um, like I want to apologize and like it would be appropriate for the town council to, um, you know, offer an apology for that impact and for a process that left experts who were consulted um, feeling that their voices weren't um, weren't heard in a way that felt good to them. So um, I don't really know how to wordsmith that, but I guess that's what I'm feeling at the moment. Yeah, thanks for that clarification. And I, I think wordsmithing, it is gonna be uh, pretty important. Um, and so the role of this committee then would be just to say, we uh, encourage the town council to go ahead and. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I'm sort of curious what your, what your honest assessments are, but does that seem like a good path forward to you to, um, you know, encourage? I'm glad to hear that that Sarah and Jeff have already been in communication about this, but would it be your your encouragement for us to try wordsmithing something and and look toward sort of rebuilding some relationships that I think have been kind of damaged through this process? Um, yeah, I think so. Um, after after the talking about it like this, I, I guess I just think that I would really want to, I know whenever I write an apology for anything, I run it by my wife and, and maybe one or two of my children to just, <laughs> just to see what buttons I might be pushing without knowing it. And um, yeah. I think that makes a lot of sense. That's smart. Tony, would, I feel... it be helpful, would it be helpful if whatever Jeff and I craft came back to the DIV committee as well as to the council to look at, just in terms Ooh. of Doug's more perspectives are back? Okay. Would you folks be interested in reviewing such a document on our behalf? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I can sure. Sure. And I, I, I really would like to get Gabriel's voice. On this yes. Too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it felt like to me something totally precious and valuable was offered in the August 2020, um, and and it was not really treated as a, a valuable, important guiding thing. Um, yeah, I think we missed so, an opportunity there. To see that, because I already had a sense that, oops, with the sign, but then to see that that at an early juncture, there was another path that was made available. And, and then it was sad that we didn't uh, follow up in the way that it was, it seemed like there was gonna be follow-up, you know, a grant, cultural something. Uh, so all of that was. Yeah, so you, your words there was may be a good beginning. We missed an opportunity, <laughs> right? It's part of the apology, yeah. Sorry to cut in on you if I did there, Mo. Yes. That was definitely something that I noticed that I highlighted a lot in my notes was um, there was a lot of great opportunities that were offered for education in that very first meeting. And I think that that was something that I took very seriously to heart. I have a note here that literally says, we as, a D as DEIB seriously need to invest in this important education. And then Wabanaki Reach was the organization that I kind of cited because um, as explained, I believe by, it was James who kind of basically said like, the whole point of this is to teach people how to approach like the Penobscot Nation and other tribes with a meaningful outlook rather than this patronizing idea of going in to help with no actual idea what you're doing. And one of the things that I really highlighted was, um, I think that we need to do the work to educate ourselves somewhat on our own, because I feel like constantly questioning the <laughs> tribe members often feels very burdensome on folks. And I feel like it can feel as though we're constantly looking for direction from people who would rather has, have us come in somewhat educated. And I feel like we should be offering connection and liaison, liaison once we have some education to really meet them at like a specific level. And I feel like that that would be like kind of an invaluable source for us to really educate ourselves the best we can with the resources we can get because I think that like, it does put a lot of pressure on people to always be the one who's like asked. 
especially in like minority groups. In what you're saying, Michael, I think about how much better prepared I feel to come here tonight because somebody gave me those links in front of me and I could go and consult what work has, uh, has already been presented and I you know, got my little dose of education, but we let it not end with us. You know, Maybe there's a way with um, the, the work that has been done to continue to shape an Orono culture that's really aware of how many people belong here. That, uh, doesn't make the same mistakes of a razor into the future, it will take more education for sure. Yeah, I think education is such a big part of what we need to be doing. And I feel like as sort of a body that we are, and also like this also is very reflective also to the town council, um, this idea of, kind of meeting people where they're at, I feel like offers somewhat more of a level of trust and I feel like also it would be good as there is relationships that need repairing, which I think if we come in with this idea of like, we're just asking questions again, it feels like it, it feels shaky in, in my opinion to um, go back into it in the same way. Like, I feel like there needs to be a very uh, revolutionary in a way change about the way that we approach them because obviously like when if there's a need to rebuild a relationship there's a need to rebuild trust sonia do you know did the did wabanaki reach ever come and do a training here either for the council or for staff and have we ever thought about opening up the council chamber space to do a training for anyone in the community who wanted to come do it or does anyone know it was conversation that's a great, that's a great question sarah i am not aware of that having been done in the past which doesn't mean that it hasn't been but i certainly haven't um heard about or had the opportunity to participate in one and i think it would be a wonderful thing um i participated in their trainings in other groups and other formats and it's they were they've been awesome so I think it could be a good resource. Hello, uh, I see that you've joined us, Chief. I have, yeah. Um, Jeff Lowe, I'm the Public Safety Director. I'm the pseudo Sophie tonight. Um, so I can tell you that we have not had um, any staff level training in the six years that I've been here. And I look at Lori, who's been here um, probably a thousand years, and she's shaking her head no either. So certainly, you know, any history around this topic would be would be great for, for staff to be able to have to gain a better understanding of, of uh, what we're talking about. Yeah, I'm I'm kind of surprised, honestly, like, because it was brought up at least like six times mm -hmm. across like the meeting. We watched about three meetings, uh, these three meetings. Um, and Wabanaki Reach was constantly talked about and constantly brought into the forefront of like, let's bring them in to do a training. There was even conversation about um, one of the council members who had gone to a Wabanaki Reach training and talked about how, what an amazing experience it was. And I am kind of surprised that like with all the conversation around it, that that wasn't something that like was ever instated. So this started, this conversation was around 2020, do you think is when it uh, That conversation was, was in uh, August of 2020, yes. So that would have been around COVID. So I, I understood. I have no doubt that that probably derailed whatever whatever we were trying to do but certainly yeah, it's right. it's nothing we would uh, push away from if it was if it was offered or, or whatever yeah yeah of course the good news I, I wonder if... go ahead Sarah I was just going to say the one update to this whole timeline I guess is that at our last council meeting which one was that Dan I don't know we voted for to put money in an assigned fund for addressing these issues. So there is $50,000 in an assigned fund at this point, which is there to address any changes that need to happen to signage, any creative ideas moving beyond the signage, also paying a Wabanaki, uh, sorry, a Penobscot um, consultant so that they're a paid DEIB consultant to come in and do that work with us. And I think probably some of that money could also be for Wabanaki Reach training potentially. It's anything in this regard is what that money has been assigned for. So that is something the council took. Yeah. I don't know the name. So, so this is a go ahead. Sorry. I was just um sort of wanting to 
facilitate a tiny little process of like, is I've seen some heads nod and gotten the sense that a Wabanaki REACH training is something that a number of folks here think would be a great idea to propose for staff and council. Can I sort of see like thumbs up, thumbs sideways about whether whether folks agree with that? I see a couple thumbs up. So community, like it, how however Wabanaki REACH would want to pattern it. To yeah. They do group uh, sessions from the description of the council members' uh, experiences with it. So. Yeah. Um, what were you? So, I think someone yeah, else was going to jump in, but go ahead. Go ahead. Sonia, this is Dan DeMera. I'm here with Sarah and well, with everybody, but sitting next to Sarah. And it was our, at our September council meeting, and we set this 50000 aside. So what we have to do is come back to council with a, with a proposal for the full council to respond to. It could be, could be in increments, I suppose. Uh, it doesn't have to be the whole. It doesn't have to be the whole fifty thousand dollars. One proposal. It could be you know several elements as they as they come together, and it's not a you know it's 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 set us it's set aside so it's so we can make it make it work with whatever you know we need to do. Requires another vote to use it, it another vote. but it's assigned yeah. only. Yeah. Yeah. and I assume I would well I don't know that we we didn't. We didn't define how the polls would come forward, but I very much welcome this committee. I, I assume the thing would be this committee would have a role in bringing those kinds of things forward for us to, to consider. That's it. Thank you. Cool. Just Doug, did you, Doug, did you want to oh. jump in? Go right ahead. This is, you know, always tricky with the hybrid meeting format. It is. It is. I guess. Um, the, the, the caution I have is to jump right into a training when I think that it might be a, a good first step might be just to have someone reach out to Wabanaki Reach, um, because what I heard was that they are good advising on how to be an ally. And uh, there may be other steps than a training for us. So I thought to use them as a consultant and see what they might recommend for how to proceed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks for that that idea of sort of soliciting their leadership's input about what the appropriate next step for us might be. That seems like a really um, sort of thoughtful next step. Do other folks feel good about that? All right. Um, I wonder who wants to do that. Um, Sarah, have you already been in touch with, with anyone there or I can reach out, I'd be happy to. I think I have their executive director's contact. It might be good for a member of the committee to do it. Sure. Would would one of you all be interested in reaching out? I would be. Awesome. Thanks, Doug. Yeah. Good. Yeah, kind of along a similar vein. Um, one thing that I was just thinking, as I imagine. Um, sort of utilizing this funding that the council has set aside for this kind of yet to be emerging purpose is that um, really focusing on uh, sort of rebuilding relationship and making sure that the way that we're allocating funding is is in tandem with and based on um, the guidance and advice of Penobscot people um, feels really important to me. I assume that either obviously uh, Sarah or Sonia can answer this, but um, is there a formal, I know that usually in order to allocate funds, there's a formal definition of what that is actually for. And I'm just curious as to what that is. Yeah, so this is like, a, um, it's not the normal budget process. It's like there are some sort of un- allocated unused funds as um, the end of the fiscal year is being reconciled that the town council had an opportunity to um, reappropriate for different purposes. I'm sort of glossing over the details of this, but that's essentially what happened is that um, there was an opportunity for the town council to say, we'd like to set aside some things for special projects that's outside of the normal budget season. And this is 
um, something that the council as a whole um, decided uh, would be a, a worthy priority. I got most of it. Okay, it turned you, you, can, you can also look back um, at the, it was just a couple council meetings ago that we had the conversation about that. So if anyone listening in or any of you are, are curious about the details, feel free to go back to that old yeah. meeting recording. Yeah, because I think that one of the things that I think is important is to, um, there was a lot of talk about like keeping up high, adhering to high standards. And I think that making sure we have like a clean formal process going forward is really crucial. I think you know, I, I think that too, and hopefully if we do send something formal to the Penobscot Tribal Council that would begin that level of formal conversation. So if they wanted to have input, they could. And if they didn't want to, they could say, you know, we think it's great, go work with Wabanaki Reach or whoever else, but I think something formal to the tribal council sounds good at this point. Yeah, because based on your research, of course, you kind of found that they're just not interested in any more informal processes. If not for the research, it would, it, it might have gone on, uh, there was, this big slippage and if I were them I'd want more traction before I try it again and I'm thinking that this was great and the person of you represents it I think structurally perhaps the committee can also represent there's going to be a grip there's going to be traction or not necessarily not guaranteed but if there's a slippage this time it could get caught sooner <laughs> it, it does not promise very much I wish it were more but I do see a role for the committee somehow in making that listening stick. Yeah. Yeah. I do think there's a really important role in folks who have set aside time to really give thought to, um, to these sort of like complex relational processes and have in their heads and hearts to like, you know, hold that and look for balls being dropped so that we don't kind of repeat, repeat old mistakes. So I'm grateful to have, um, you know, this, this group sort of providing more collective wisdom and opportunity to, you know, keep, keep your elected officials um, moving forward in ways where we, we don't sort of like, just sort of get in a rut and become blind to what we're what we're doing or what we said we'd do that we then forget to do, which does happen. So please, um, yeah, be, be tracking things and pushing us on it. Yeah, I think that leads into something that I was thinking about that I think you mentioned partially earlier um, is kind of accountability in a way. Because I feel like there's so much room for like fun stuff and fun stuff, but we really like both the town and kind of obviously us sort of an extension like accountability sort of always feels better when it comes with an apology because I feel like like it's like when obviously not to simplify this down in any way or shape but like when you're a kid and the apology that some kid gives you is super you're like that that's not it but then if you're like all right I'm sorry and then they don't do it again in the future that's super important. And I feel like that both of those things together will give us, like you said, that traction. Because I feel like if they've said, as Sarah said, like if that's what they've said is our next step before anything else, then that needs to be our next step. Like we can plan as much as we want, but unless we rebuild trust, we rebuild that relationship and we provide that apology that they are directly asking for, like that's where it is. Do we know um, after June, 2021, um, how Penobscot Nation leaders think of the, the acknowledgement statement, the, the acknowledgement of presence 
Um, yeah, it was supposed to be a living document that they were supposed to go back to. So I wonder if there was any re thing about it. I believe that there, I, you know, I don't know. Um, I don't remember exactly who was consulted in the drafting and passing of this document, but I believe that it, that actually that resolve um, did have review by some um, Penobscot folks. Sarah may know. Sarah, what's your recollection of this? Um, I, Jeff in the meeting, Jeff Wingard, who worked on it, said that it had gone out to multiple people and the folks from the Penobscot Nation who responded back with feedback were John Bear Mitchell, John Banks, and Darren Renko. Yeah, yeah, that sounds about right. That's what I have in the notes there. Well, I think it's a thing to lift up going forward. Yeah. And then you, could, you have a statement, then you try to live into it, and then you try better, and then you try again. So if that's a good statement that people have said. Yeah, I'd love to know if that's still a statement that resonates with people as well, because obviously, like, if it is looking to be some kind of living document, then, like, at what points do we need to look at it again? Like, is there, like, a do we look at it every three years, every five years, you know, like. Yeah, and what would be our recommendation? It? Like, given yeah. that council turns over every X number of years, uh, could we make a recommendation to have the kind of education we were just describing? on some schedule that corresponds. So, yeah, so that all council members get it. Yeah, so that everybody comes into that cultural story, which is bigger and deeper and better. Do you have any wisdom for us? Timing ones. Do I have any wisdom for you? Either of you. I'd love to know either of your thoughts on this. So my thoughts on this are, uh, one is I'm, I'm I'm kind of excited to uh, to be present for this undertaking because it's you had talked about growth mindset earlier. In my mind, this is a, a great reset to actually do better than we had done before. You know, we had the the image of of the chief, but in my mind, I'm thinking that this is really an opportunity to. Um, expand on that. And I don't know why we couldn't um, co-name places like the university has done, whether it's streets or parks or whatever the case may be. Um, and, you know, if, if not that price is an issue, but if we were concerned about price, I mean, that's that's a small thing, I, I, I think, to, um, to acknowledge a space like you had talked about. I, I think you had talked about the space and, and identifying the culture. That's two ways to do that, to, to build that place so that we don't we don't lose that. It's not erased, I think is, is one great thing. The second thing I would throw at you is, this is gonna be a major undertaking, even though it may not feel like it right now, uh, or maybe it does, I don't know, but um, I would recommend a um, somebody start a project book um, whether it's uh, on a laptop or whatever, so that as you go through this and you start to have these conversations or you run into hiccups along the way or, um, you know, there was a curveball thrown at you or whatever, you can record those things so that one, the entire group is on the same page. You have something that you can reference back to instead of memories or trying to rifle through um, video. Um, but it's a legacy of how this process went for people that come behind you. Or if you have to do something similar to this in the future, you've got a document you can reference back to and say, OK, this is a problem we have now. What did we do when we um, when we tried to, um, you know, um, correct our correct, correct the errors associated with the with the uh, rebranding or whatever the case may be, if that makes sense to you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think that that's, that's such an awesome the, the third thing I would tell you is that the sooner we know, as far as town staff goes, the sooner we know what you're thinking about doing, um, the better it is, um, because that allows us to shift. Changing municipal government, just like federal government, is changing a battleship in, in, in water. It takes forever to slow down and then turn. And the more lead time we have, um, the more responsive we can be to what it is that that um, you all are trying to to get to. So um, sometimes sometimes it takes us a while to get to where um, people want us to be, and it's not because we're not responsive. It just takes a while to roll everything back, figure out which way we got to go, and then start moving that way. So I guess that's what I would I would throw out to you is just 
um, give us lead time. And if we have to come back and say, we don't fully understand what you're looking for, it's, it's not us challenging you. It's, it's we just want to know exactly. We want, the, we want to know the vision so that we can meet, meet what it is that you expect. So, and I'll shut up now. Thanks for those reflections. Much appreciated. I'm really glad that we had this meeting because I feel like it gives a chance to not only kind of get new voices as, yeah. as we get kind of drop in guests, but also like I I really like seeing kind of the perspectives of everybody's different things because obviously like as I'm looking through my own notes, like I notice things that may be like more or less important now that I'm kind of like talking about them. And like I'm like there's a lot of things like one of the things that I talked about was kind of the idea that um, like the conversation between like um, sort of going back to accountability, I suppose, but like uh, council members who were talking in like the groups about like holding the municipality, it was like holding the municipality um, and holding itself to a high standard. And it was, like kind of it was a little disheartening I guess and I think I can understand as well from um somewhat of why the like Penobscot Nation would be unhappy was the idea of like uh they talked about also in Sarah's document was promising things that you aren't going to do or that you won't deliver and I think that there's so much promise in talking about things that you want to do. And I don't think that that's a bad thing at all. I think it's great to like get ideas, but I think that one of the things that frustrated me a lot with some of the conversations around this topic was there never felt like there was a concrete next step. And I feel like it was a lot of, oh, well, we want to do this. We want to do this. And then I felt like the timeline just felt so stretched out in a way that I could see that people would be frustrated with the way that process would go for the process to not only take so long, but then for it to be done incorrectly. I feel like that there's a lot of, a lot of things that should go into making sure that doesn't happen, but also that like, it's good that it's, we're allowed to learn from our mistakes as well. Like as much as, like we and the town council are representative of something larger. I also think that we are perfectly allowed to say, all right, I'm sorry, we messed up with genuine like intention. And then also say, all right, we wanna go forward once we understand that we can be like that you understand that we want to respect your wishes going forward and not only learning what that means on our own but also figuring out what is meaningful to that so like one of the things that we uh, that was talked about both in the videos and in Sarah's document was the idea of um like paid consultants and really making sure that when we're bringing on people that we are valuing their time and their effort and we're paying them appropriately for doing so. And I think that that's such an important thing. And it also goes into kind of full circle of the whole wanting to have a formal, uh, like a more formal clean process. And I think that idea of um, respecting the connection and respecting the relationship in multiple ways would really benefit us. So I appreciate what um, was said just recently about, you know, next steps and then doing them. <laughs> And um, I'm curious if we're kind of, well, if there are other noticings and reflections and uncoverings that need to happen, that's, that's awesome. And um, I also think it might be nice to kind of leave this meeting with, with a good sense of 
um, of next steps that you folks would recommend to the town council or are going to undertake. And I know that, um, you know, thanks Doug for, for being willing to reach out to Wabanaki Reach as an example of that. Um, yeah, you're welcome. And I, I guess this isn't quite along the lines of what you're asking, Sonia, but one of the things I was really struck by was seeing this land before the town was here on the maps. And particularly the thing that caught me was the carrying place. And I found myself really wanting to know where that was. And I and so in my mind, I was putting the the history of uh, paddling and canoeing that the Penobscot nation. I mean, some Penobscot paddlers have won the national um, canoe races. <clears throat> and we have a fairly vibrant uh, canoe club in town. And I don't know, somehow those things just came together in my mind and I wondered, just generally, there may be an avenue uh, around water travel that uh, would be fun and, um, and productive to explore. But I don't have any other formed ideas about it, just, just those, those thoughts that got connected. With like the As he time. narrated the aerial view, I was remembering different places I've put in a kayak. That's one of the things that uh, I'm able-bodied able enough to do is paddle here and there. Um, but one of them is, is it, isn't it the place that town council is looking at making a park is down at um, like across from a Ayers, whatever its name, the island that there used yeah. to be. Yeah. So there's yes. a boat launch. I guess Dan can speak to this. Go ahead, Dan. We're gonna put a Ferris wheel at the boat launch <laughs> if we can get it past the fire chief. No, we're, uh, the basic neighborhood community is coming together to talk about um, you know, what we could do to re-envision, reinvigorate that space as a community gathering space. So we had a, we had a, like as a potluck type event, a barbecue uh, block party. We call it like all the names are interchangeable. Yeah. We got together at, uh, about a month ago at the boat launch, had like a community little meal on a Sunday. And then this past weekend, weekend before last, uh, a bunch of neighbors got together at, at OBC to talk about, to start forming a, a plan. In that same meeting where we uh, committed $50,000 in unassigned balances towards this initiative, with um, we, we set aside $10,000 to fund that. And I think it could be a phenomenal you know, opportunity to do two things at once. Maybe if there's a bad signage really or some way to like experience the water, you know. Because somebody uh, described that project to me and I had this sense that it was an um, opportunity of taking a space and making a place. That's right. like the idea I came away with. Yep. And as as um, as Professor Runco and uh, Professor Francis were talking about the same thing, like the place, making it a place would involve naming it in ways that are relevant to all the people. Yeah. And that could be, a, yeah, could there's be the, those things coming together. There's the industrial history in that neighborhood, you know, kind of how the basin was named and the island used to be used for manufacturing. And, and then even for, you know, of course, further back, the you know, Penobscot Nation and, and their use of place there. So I, I And the carrying place. Doug, does that line up? Is that what you remember about where the carrying place was? Um, I, no, no, I was thinking the carrying place may be across um, to where our bridge goes across to Marsh Island. I was thinking that might be a spot because that's above the falls. So, oh. but I, it just made me curious and want to know. Yeah, yeah, we could. But it, it's would be, it would be so fun to to have like a scavenger hunt that's based on on sort of a pre-settlement map where you try to like you go for a paddle and try to find these different places along the river or something yeah yeah Thanks. i think the beginning of the places where you were talking about malcolm uh yeah i was just curious yeah but i like that i like some kind of an idea like that i'd be where he said there was oh uh, yeah like you said there was two the navigating that there was then was to connect to people that you were related to and this is part of our navigation also in the 21st century, connect to the people we're related to and the water is part of that. Especially since Orno and it's obviously surrounding pieces are still even in the modern era, very heavily based into the river. 
And I think that like that shows a very um, unavoidable, not unavoidable, but like uh, unignorable, I guess, mm -hmm. intrinsically linked idea of the, the native mindset is still very much that the connection to the water, the connection to the river, the connection to the land, like that never goes away. People for thousands of years have used what the land gives them for resources. Obviously you see that up through like water wheels and, uh, and like even up to like really high tech fishing weirs. Um, and there's lots of that idea of uh, using what the land gives you and basing it on what's already there. We have a comment. We have a comment from a Zoom attendee. Is this a good time? Yes, that, I think that would be great. The other folks agree? Bring it on. Okay, I'm going to allow Danielle Gabrielli. Oh, wonderful. Actually, Danielle is a member of the committee, so f feel free to promote her to panelist. Danielle, welcome. I'm glad you're here. Oh, you're, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, kind of came in with my background from my classes. I apologize. But anyways, um, I am really interested, particularly in this piece, because I see a lot of students are actively engaged and really interested in taking this information and really turning into something that can help our students, like in the K-12 schools. Teachers are so busy and, um, you know, they often don't have access to lesson plans or materials that surround these types of ideas that can really be beneficial for them to teach the youth as we also want them to know the truth. We want them to be able to grow and um, really understand the real history of Orno. And so um, I appreciate, and I bring in that idea and I appreciate the idea of the scavenger hunt, which is something that I think could easily in some way or another tie into this as well. Um, but I just wanted to share from my own point of view, I feel like if we're going to make a change, we need to start with sharing this information with you. Thank you. I guess I'm doing a little um, popcorn in here, um, but I've thought of one other concrete thing that might be simple to do, and that's to reach out to our sister city in Minnesota, because James Francis mentioned that they knew more about the heritage uh, than we than the town of Orono and Maine. And in addition to that, they have found a way to, to uh, connect with the university in Bemidji um, to work with the university to promote the history or to, to educate people about the history of Orono. So I, anyway, I thought, let's find out what they did. That's a great idea, Doug. Cool. Um, maybe that is sort of a, a good segue back to, um, well, I guess first Danielle, since you're joining um, maybe a little bit late, I'm not sure how much of the meeting you got a chance to overhear, but if you had any big picture um, kind of reflections on ho on the homework you were able to do, that would be awesome to hear. And also by way of summarizing a couple things we've talked about this meeting and people can fill in the gaps if I miss anything important. Um, we kind of talked about this, uh, this idea and are recommending to the town council that a, a formal apology to the tribal council does feel like a, an important next step in this process. Um, Pretty uh, formal, right? Yeah. Pardon? Formal, Formal, yes. Um, and there has been, the town council has allocated $50,000 to um, to a project as yet to be kind of figured out to redo signage in town in consultation with and, um, you know, like hiring consultants who are able to provide um, expertise if, if there are folks who would want to work with us on that. Um, and uh, other highlights. Um, uh, Doug is going to reach out to an organization called Wabanaki Reach and have a conversation about what they might recommend as next steps potentially involving training for staff and town council. And this group could potentially be part of that too um, about 
uh, Penobscot and Wabanaki history. Those are a few things that um, have emerged from this meeting. Thank Not an so exhaustive much. list. <laughs> yeah, for me, like when I was looking for everything, I think the overall arching idea was that there is so much that I just don't know at this point. And um, learning this is really helpful in terms of how I teach my own diversity course and really making sure that I'm getting the accurate information. I think there's a lot of information out there, but it's not equitable and it's not the reality of things. And so I'm really grateful to personally be able to have a digested, digested those pieces and to really understand there is so much more than I originally thought. So I'm challenging myself in this process and um, I'm looking forward to in some way, like I think it was Michael that spoke about making amends. So I appreciate the formal apology. I think I definitely um, want to jump right in on that. Thank you. Um, awesome. So uh, counselors, Marks and Wingard are um, hopefully going to draft something together and then um, with this group would have an opportunity to review and, and give comments on that and yeah. help craft something that hopefully is, is setting a good tone. So this may be assumed, but um, as we move forward with next steps to also include the nation, um, not just reach out to Wabanaki Reach, but reconnect with um, those in the nation, whether it's um, James Francis, Darren Rocco, or um, well, so just wanted to make that connection. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think that that would be the role of like a formal apology to the tribal council is to be, um, kind of right. reestablishing that that bridge toward um, training, sort of collab like a formal collaborative work environment or um, working relationship. I really appreciated what Lori just said because I think one of the important things that I've been trying to do just in this brief amount of time when I put this timeline together and reached out to folks at the suggestion of Jeff and Sophie, our town manager, has been to be sure that I've continued to loop folks back in on what's happening. So I feel like Darren and James were officially consulted in 2020. I had a conversation with them when I put the timeline together. I emailed that out to them and I you know, very respectfully said, I don't expect you to look at this. I don't expect you to need to spend your time on it, but I don't want you out of the loop either. So it's here. And if you, you just to be informed about what the next thing is, it's coming to the DIB committee. Um, Jeff Wingard and I will be meeting. And so it's my intention. And I think it's really great to bring it to everyone's attention to just continue to include because it seems like something got dropped in that process. And I don't want people to feel again, like it gets dropped and people aren't included or cycled back. So thank you for bringing that forward. I think it's important. And seeing Danielle and remembering your email of earlier today, I'm wondering if there's another chance to have a little learning moment here where you talked about your work as an educator, Danielle, and you wondered if like resources and curriculum exist um, there was actually uh, state law, what, 20 years ago, that K-12 education would include Wabanaki history in a way that if you're an adult, you don't, you don't get that necessarily, but if you're K-12, through 12, there's something. Um, what do we know about that? And yeah, what could we, since there's a school board member in the room, like, what do we, uh, what can we in the community draw from what the schools are able to do? So, uh, yeah. Brian McGill, member of the school board. Uh, also, this afternoon, the Wabanaki Studies Committee of the RSU 26 uh, working group met this afternoon. So there's been an active ongoing process for a year and a half now, uh, almost two years uh, working. I mean, you're absolutely right, Malcolm. There's the, a formal law to incorporate this. And I think most districts, certainly RSU 26, kind of looked at that and said, you know what, we kind of did a unit in the fourth grade on Wabanaki people, mostly Wabanaki history. It's right, very, very past focused. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think we're realizing that is not meeting the spirit of the law, nor the spirit of being a good neighbor, nor the spirit of 10% uh, of our students actually identifying as having Native American heritage. We discovered in a survey that's not something that shows up in the official statistics, but when we did a self-identifying survey, that's you know a pretty large fraction. Um, so there's an active group and an active committee. Um, 
And yeah, I mean, I can share a lot more of it. It's been going for two years, just met this afternoon, they meet once a month. Uh, at this point, the primary focus is actually getting, it's been a lot of emphasis in professional development. So there's been significant professional development events that have happened over the last two years for the teachers. Okay. In terms of training, there's books, there's ongoing book study groups that are happening. Uh, there's multiple, I just, just um, saw one that's happening this afternoon. Uh, there's one of the trainings they did, a, they watched a video, I forget which video they watched. But, so there's been professional development, teacher training. There's also been a large effort to find resources that uh, can be made available to teachers. Many teachers are like, yeah, I want to teach this. I get the importance of it, but I don't personally know enough. So hence the professional development, and also the focus on uh, resources that are available. The uh, district in Portland uh, is one of the few districts that really fully embrace this. And so we've been borrowing uh, material and lessons from them, but there's also, there's substantial resources. Um, uh, I forget the name of the uh, museum in uh, Abbott, yeah, Abbey. The Abbey Museum is producing significant materials that we're doing too. So we're trying to connect teachers with learning materials. So there is a significant parallel effort happening in the schools. I think we should make a shout out to our library also, yeah. because I know that there's really good books and resources that are added to all the time there. And every time I go in, I see new ones that are there that are on Penobscot picture books, Penobscot history for all ages. And really thank you to the library staff because it's clear to me that you guys are doing a really concerted thing about that. It grows every time I'm in there. Thank you. Libraries are such intrinsic parts of getting it. amazing education out, especially on topics that may be really unsung. But I also feel like I really do have to give you such an amazing hand, round of applause, if you will, um, because obviously having a library just there, yes, you can access those resources, but by you taking them and highlighting them, especially when people walk in and seeing them, that gives such an important push up even more. And so that's really awesome. Thank you. So this may be premature and it may be too much of a conversation for tonight, but we are looking at expansion at some point, hopefully in the near future. And there has been talk about incorporating some kind of um, artwork that talks about sense of place for Orono. And certainly this, uh, this whole conversation could tie into that. Um, we're not there yet, but it certainly has been talked about. Um, so, yeah. I'm curious what conversation loop looks like and feedback it looks like that's made your collection so wonderful so far. Where is that coming from? Yes, yeah, so I would say, especially in the children's section, um, there's just a huge push on diverse literature. Um, Lindsay, who's our youth services librarian, is kind of a, not, I wouldn't call her an expert, but she's well, well versed in it. And is, there's a huge push, especially in children's literature, to get um, books out that, that uh, represent a variety of um, diversity, you know, a diverse uh, population. And I mean, books are coming out all the time. It, it's the topic. It's the topic. <laughs> um, that's really in the forefront, so. Thank you. If that answers your question. Yeah, thanks. All right, so we've got um, 10 minutes left, uh, should we need them? And I'm curious if now's a good time to kind of reiterate, what, what are we doing next? <laughs> um. So I have actually taken some Formal notes down for what next steps are. Great. So uh, our initial uh, next step is to reach out to Wabanaki Reach. Uh, Doug will be taking the forefront on that. Um, we obviously, as a DEIB, we've recommended a formal apology to town council as kind of our uh, recommendation for reparations. Repit. Whatever repair, the word for yeah, repair. I, th I think re repair probably more rather than reparations in this context. But I was trying to find a form of the word repair. 
Um, we are also looking on possibly reconnecting with uh, Darren Renko and uh, James Eric Francis. I think there's also potential uh, to look about reaching out to the uh, connections that were made for the land acknowledgement. Um, obviously, that will uh, depend on whether or not they would like to be like formally consultants or if they're just, um, if they're all right with just being a conversational um, connection, it's up to them, of course. But I think that our big things are the recommend, the apology recommendation and reaching out to Wabanaki Reach, as well as Jaron Ranko and James Eric Francis. I think, um, kind of a food for thought would definitely be looking into maybe some um, artists in our local native groups and just kind of seeing what's going on with them and maybe um, kind of having them not exactly uh, talking to them as the town would, but sort of just as uh, the DIB and giving them chance to really talk about the creative aspects of what they're doing with their um their art and their culture uh, just a couple things um gabriel is an artist in the community so he's such a potentially great resource for that um and the other thing i would say is when i reach out to wabanaki reach i i want to ask them about reaching out to the nation and how to how to go about those conversations uh, in in a way that's respectful and building of relationship. So I'll report back what I hear from them and what their recommendations would be. Awesome, thank you. Just so folks know, the executive director of Wabanaki Reach right now, Maria Gerard, is on tribal council for the Penobscot Nation, and is one of the people who emailed us when the signs were changed. Um, uh, so, you know, I think there are some strong feelings about it. And I, I do think that it's great, Doug, I think just being careful about the sequence of steps a little bit, like Lori's bringing up and Doug's bringing up. And I think, I think something formal needs to happen before we do any asking about partnering going forward. The message we've had is, you know, there needs to be some kind of apology and acknowledgement just that it didn't go quite right. And we want to fix that before we start bombarding people with requests, if that's helpful. Yeah, okay. Then I think kind of, I think our formal next step is then putting a pin in that. Our formal next step is waiting to hear from town council on um, formal apology and kind of how that goes and what that relationship is looking like as a result of that. And then we can kind of hold on to connecting with Wabanaki Reach until there is a better resolution there because I think obviously um, Maria Gerard being an intrinsic part of the tribal council uh, that obviously puts a very, uh, we would have to be very delicate and I think that it would be a lot more beneficial to wait until we have that apology going forward. So I think the DIB is just sort of gonna hang out for a minute with that one until we can get some words on that. So that's a proposal. Sonia, do you, or Doug, do you think that that, I think that talking to Wabanaki Reach, who what they do is they run trainings and you pay them to run trainings. I think it's fine to reach out okay. about the trainings. I just would not want to reach out about 5 million other ideas. I think okay. the trainings is a good idea to reach out about personally, but Sonia or anyone else? Okay. Yeah. Sarah, my, Sarah, my, intent, then, my intent in reaching out is to listen. Yeah. yeah. I think asking how meetings and what they would cost and that we're interested in having them would be great in my mind. Yeah, I, I think I agree. I think sort of to like maybe very briefly summarize uh, Michael's summary, kind of two next steps. One that's a really relational reset, reach out mostly to listen that Doug will do on our behalf seems like a wonderful thing. And then also to be in touch with the town council as we come up with perhaps informed by that um, in part, a, uh, a formal apology that um, feels like it strikes the right note of trying to 
make amends and move forward. Yeah. Does that seem like a good summary? And then we have like so many wonderful ideas for um, yeah. what is possible in the future, but I think um, things need to move at the speed of relationship. Um, and so prioritizing the relational aspects of next steps feels good to me and I think is what I've heard through through the conversation tonight. Yeah, absolutely. Sonia, can I ask one other thing? I know we're right at the end, but just um, Chief Lowe's idea of some kind of project book where people are tracking. Yes, I have that things. marked down. Is anyone willing to start that? Because I really do think that's important that we're tracking this conversation, not just by the minutes of this meeting, but in a file that gets kept track of from month to month that we check in on where we're at. So no more balls get. Yes, I will work on that. Um, it may end up being kind of a collaborative piece for the uh, the DEIB, but I will take up the forefront on that for now. We have our next meeting in just two weeks, not a whole month. So those items and, and this piece, like how we would do that over yeah. time and make it or go yeah. over time, we could come we back and set the, the, this on that agenda so it doesn't get lost. Yeah, we can set like a little piece of time for um discussing what we want our project book to look like all right it is uh 728 but obviously if anybody has any uh questions or concerns feel free to let us know if there's anybody on zoom as well feel free no hands raised at this time all right and Ready. um I think Malcolm, you're facilitating next meeting. Is that true? That's right. Yeah. Great. All right. So potluck invitation. I know you all are not oh. hosting next yes. month, but this one is happening this coming Sunday, October 1st, 4.30 to 6.30. Please come, invite other people you know, come join the fun. Yes, cool. definitely everybody check out the town council's potluck. Just a quick note, I did reach out to five or six um, colleagues at the university uh, describing this and asking if there could be any assistance with transportation. And uh, I've heard nothing back. I'm sorry. Well, thank you. Thank you for reaching out. It was an important step. And I guess we can talk, we can talk about that when we meet and see if um, we can come up with more ideas on that front, I guess. Sonia, we did hear at the council meeting that I think there is at least going to be a community member starting some kind of like ride share list that's not that's officially great. run by or by the DIB committee, but just community members. So like a but other folks who are willing to pick someone up who okay. wants to come. So hopefully by November, that community list will start. Um, so that's a little bit. But thanks, Doug. If you hear anything back, bands would be great too. Appreciate it. Oh. Thank you. All right. All right. Meeting adjourned. All right. Uh, good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Good night.